Hello again. It's been a while since I've recorded a video for YouTube, but during my hiatus, I've been running a very slow experiment to demonstrate what I believe to be a YouTube unique and zero monetary cost solution for measuring the presence of alpha radiation from relatively hot sources that you might encounter in your daily life. The concept for this video was inspired by a recent Veritasium video, as well as some remarks made by my physics professor during class. In Veritasium's recent video, he discusses how a Kodak engineer was able to determine the successful execution of the Trinity nuclear test prior to the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki during the Second World War. The Kodak engineer had discovered that X-ray film, which was typically encased in paper to protect it from radiation, that was sourced from supplies that had lower than natural radium content so as to decrease naturally occurring alpha particle radiation and not develop the x-ray film prematurely had failed to do its job and the x-ray film had been developed anyway. The reason for this is that radioactive fallout from the Trinity nuclear test had contaminated the paper mill supply and then ruined the film when the film was placed inside this not specially not radioactive paper. My physics professor had mentioned in class that a similar effect can occur with just normal paper as opposed to x-ray film. That alpha radiation could cause burning or yellowing of normal paper. Now I sought to demonstrate this effect with a rather hot sample of an alpha emitter that you can source relatively cheaply and without too much regulatory hurdles to jump through. This here is a sample of polonium-210 that's from a static master anti-static brush and this here is a 500 microcurie sample that was manufactured in March of 2020. In comparison, this here is a smoke detector americium sample, which also emits alpha particles, as well as some gamma radiation, as shown in a, another one minute video on my channel, where the Geiger counter here, with a glass tube, is actually able to detect something because it emits gamma radiation as well, is about one microcurie in strength. The half-life of americium is like 400 years or something, so this guy pretty much never decays on the scale that uh, we're dealing with, and this guy has already gone through like two half-lives since it's been manufactured, about eight months, with 138 day half-life, that's about four months. So this guy is probably 250, uh, 125 microcurie by now. When I opened the box, I noticed that the pattern of the steel was basically etched into the paper here with the white paper being where the steel blocked the alpha particles and the yellow being where it was able to burn the paper. Now, that was six months when it was quite a bit stronger and knowing that it would be weaker and with the short half-life and still wanting to replicate this result, I took another piece of paper and in about mid-September, I placed this piece of paper under the grating here right next to the sample and I left it that way for two and a half to three months until December now. So this right here now has two yellow strips that aren't as intense as the uh, radiation burns on this piece of paper, but the effect is still there. We're able to tell that there is radiation coming off of this, which is blocked by the metal there to make these kinds of patterns. Now, how do I know for sure that it's alpha particle radiation other than that this says it's polonium and I bought it from someone who says it's polonium for use in their anti-static brushes? Well, my Geiger counter with a glass tube that can only detect beta and gamma radiation, and I assume high energy neutrons, only detects background when it's placed on this. Now, I also mentioned that in another video, this americium sample here emits gamma radiation and can be detected by this tube. So I'll put this on here, and we'll see that count go up because of the gammas in addition to the alphas, and that's just something uh, interesting that I can also show you here. So while that's uh, counting up and getting up to about the level it does for the gamma emission from the americium-241, why would you want to use paper to detect alpha radiation? Well, first, the background Geiger counters can't usually detect it because of the glass tube. But they do make Geiger counters that have detachable probes, either a pancake or differently shaped probe, where you can open and close a metal gate to allow or disallow alpha particles to trip the detector. Um, but those are expensive, and I'd have to, at the very least, buy a second Geiger counter. Not that I don't want to, but I wanted a cheaper solution. There's also, uh, on YouTube, a lot of videos of people using spark gap alpha detectors to demonstrate the presence of alpha radiation. And that's where you make, like, a wire grating, and then you put a voltage potential between those wires in open air, something between, like, 8 and 30 kilovolts. And then when you bring an alpha particle source near the wires, it ionizes the air and the electricity is able to travel and arc, and then it makes cool sparks and sounds, and they're rather exciting. But they're also dangerous because, you know, you have open wires on your desk with like 15 kilovolt potential on them, um, 
with the ability to deliver enough current to give you a little shock, if not kill you. Uh, so I haven't been able to find one that looks like the YouTube video versions that's commercially sold. I thought I'd seen one at one point, but I just can't find the webpage again. And if anybody knows what company was making that, let me know, because I wanted to buy one as opposed to build one. But uh, if I can't buy one, building one is definitely on my bucket list. And if there's interest in the comments, I can rush that as far as uh, priorities for bucket list items are concerned. Uh, that being said, it's something that I intend to do eventually, but uh, haven't gotten around to it yet. So here we can see the Geiger counter's gone way up from background from 20 counts per minute to like 220 just by being exposed to the gamma radiation from the samaricium source there. So that's kind of interesting. So why do they use polonium-210 in these anti-static brushes? Uh, what are these anti-static brushes for? Why are they allowed to sell this if that sample is uh, so radioactive? And then I also want to talk a little bit about polonium in uh, popular culture as well as uh, real-world events as a poison, which is uh, an interesting topic all its own. So first, the static brushes. Anti-static brushes are used with lenses and optics to get dust off them. If you brush them with a normal brush, like, I don't know, this dustpan brush right here, what will happen is static charges will build up, and then dust will stick to the lens, and that's no fun. And you can brush it all you want, but dust will just keep sticking. So this brush is designed so that when you brush the lens, it builds up negative charges on the brush, which causes positive charges to build up on the lens. But then the negative charges on the brush are neutralized by positively charged alpha particles being emitted from this radioactive source that hit the brush and then cancel those out. And as a result of canceling out the charges on the brush that build up, you're able to cancel out the charges on the lens and the dust won't stick anymore. This is also useful for measuring very fine powders with very precise weight balances. And so the static brushes can also be used for that and not just lenses. Why do they choose polonium for this? Uh, I think two reasons. One, it's a rather active source and it's pretty easy to obtain. Uh, this 500 microcurie source is 500 times stronger than the smoke detector source. Um, I forget what a smoke detector costs, but uh, depending upon market pricing, this is one to two smoke detectors in price, I believe, for just the source there as a refill cartridge. And, I mean, if you can afford camera optics and stuff that you need that kind of uh, brush for, you can probably afford to buy one of the brushes or the refill cartridges. Also, polonium-210 is very short half-life, minimizes the risk for environmental contamination. If you were to get high quantities of americium into the environment, remember that's a gamma emitter as well as a, an alpha emitter, and the gamma radiation actually can be harmful in large quantities to humans, even externally, as opposed to just internally. Like, this here, this isn't, this radiation will not penetrate my skin, but if I were to get it in my bloodstream, I might have a problem, and we'll discuss that in just a second. Uh, but the samaricium with the gamma emission, um, you may be able to do some more damage to your skin if you had higher quantities of this. It's also important to mention that polonium-210 decays directly to lead-206 by alpha emission only. It's the end in the decay chain sequence for uranium-238, uh, so it decays very quickly into something that's inert from something that only emits alpha particles, thus making it a rather safe choice of material as far as wanting a temporarily hot radiation sample. So I assume they choose that to minimize environmental contamination and also just because it tends to be a pretty active source and you need a lot of alpha particles to neutralize charges. So with regard to polonium in uh, popular culture, the 2014 movie uh, Transcendence had the computer scientist character that's the brainiac behind brain scanning and artificial intelligence, Will Castor, who is killed by a polonium-laced bullet not by being shot by the bullet, but by polonium poisoning days later. Polonium gets into his bloodstream, and then he dies of radiation poisoning from alpha middle being in his blood, which then would quickly dissipate and not cause environmental issues, just killing the intended target. Now, that's interesting, and seems a little bit far-fetched, maybe that's too sci-fi, but this actually sort of happened in real life. Alexander Litvinenko is famous as a Russian political dissident who worked for the Russian Federation FSB, the Federal Security Service, which was Russia's successor to the USSR's KGB during the 1990s. And he made some people mad, and then he had to get out of the country, and he sought political asylum in a variety of places, and then eventually ended up in the UK. And in 2006, he became ill with polonium poisoning, 
And then in 2015, the UK found that the Russian state was likely involved in his murder. Uh, that's about where the Wikipedia page story ends on it, but polonium poisoning is very real in both pop culture and real-world political events, and I think something that's interesting to know about as a fun fact. So this has been a video about detecting off-particle radiation at basically zero cost if you're willing to wait quite a while, and polonium and its everyday use as well as some not-so-everyday uses. If you enjoyed this video, please smash that like button, hit subscribe, ring the bell, helps the channel, I'm trying to grow, and uh, let me know what you think in the comments.